Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on analytical techniques. So this is topic 22 for the CIE specification, so that's the Cambridge Internationals. So if you're studying the Cambridge International syllabus, then this video is perfect for you because it will go through um, the bits that you need for year one analytical techniques. Um, I do have the full range of A-level um, videos for CIE um, on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. Um, all I ask is that you hit the subscribe button just to show your um, support for this project. That would be great. Um, also, all of these slides are all bundled together um, to form the full um, A-level, um, year one and year two. Um, they're all available to purchase to supplement your revision. They're really good value for money. Just click on the link in the description box below and you'll be able to get them there. And that'll be absolutely fantastic if you could go and have a look at them as well. So um, let's have a look. So this is kind of the final topic for year one chemistry. Anything beyond uh, topic 22 is for year two. So it kind of ends up quite nicely with some analytical techniques. Now we're going to look at some of the analytical techniques here. The rest of them obviously looks in year two. So we're going to start with infrared. So the only two that you need to know really for year one is infrared spectroscopy and um, mass spectrometry as well. So we're going to look at them two in particular. So let's start with infrared first. Now infrared I like to call the messy spectroscopy. Um, you'll see in a minute the... Um, the um, uh, the spectrums that you get are actually quite messy. There's loads of different peaks and everything all around them, but I'll kind of explain this and show you. So infrared spectroscopy uses infrared radiation to increase the vibrational energy of covalent bonds in a sample. Okay, so obviously infrared is heat, so you fire infrared at a molecule and the bonds start vibrating um, and the atoms kind of vibrate as well. So obviously they absorb that energy. And the frequency of infrared radiation absorbed by the covalent bond depends on two things so one is the atoms that are either side of the bond um, so what type of atoms you've got and secondly is the position of that bond in the entire molecule because you'll get some um, atoms that will influence others in terms of how much energy they absorb and it can obviously impact the strength of the bond as well and what we get is we get something like this, which is a spectrum. Now, this is an example of a, an infrared spectrum of ethanoic acid here. Um, and what they'll give you in the exam is they'll give you a table of data. You're not expected to remember these numbers here at all. What you are expected to do is to be able to use the numbers here to be able to predict what functional groups are in an infrared spectrum um, and obviously work it out from there. So this is obviously ethanoic acid. So let's have a look at some of these peaks here. Now the key thing when you read in spectrum is to look at some of the kind of significant peaks. And now really in infrared, you're looking at anything really above, um, anything above about a thousand really. Anything below that is what we call a fingerprint region and it's it's a unique spectrum for that molecule, but it's something that's really difficult to read. So we're kind of looking at this end here. And what we're looking for are kind of significant peaks at these points, and that will help us identify what we've got. So in this case, we know we've got ethanoic acid, so that's a carboxylic acid. So we have an OH acid signal, so that's this bit here, at about 3,000, so it's roughly about there. And you can say obviously that fits in quite nicely with the OH acid bit as well. So we know that's definitely an acid which is there. Um, you'll not also note, let it start again. You'll also notice we have a C double bond O, C carbonyl signal about 1,700, and there it is. So there's your carbonyl group. So this obviously just evidence or documents these peaks and confirms that it is an um, carboxylic acid. And obviously we can detect changes in peaks as well when we oxidize alcohols. So for example, obviously this is a sample for ethanoic acid. But if we take that ethanoic acid and we um, oxidize, uh, let's say we reduce it for example. Um, so uh, obviously we'll form an aldehyde or a ketone. Then what you'll find is the OH bit will probably disappear. If we formed an aldehyde, that will disappear. That peak won't be there. If we ran it through the infrared, this one would still show. 
So it basically, infrared is really there to detect functional groups primarily. Um, it can be used to identify compound as well, um, sometimes outright, by using the fingerprint region. But really a computer would do that. A computer would try and match that spectrum with a library of spectrum to work that out. You're not expected to be able to do that in, you know, with, with a, a spectrum you know, by looking by eye. Okay, so um, let's have a look at that. So that, that's really all you need to know for infrared. <laughs> There's not a lot. So the rest of it is mass spectrometry. Um, this is a bit trickier, okay, um, and you have to do a little bit more work with this. I don't think you're getting it that easy. Um, so mass spectrometry is an analytical technique that can be used to determine the atomic mass of an element, okay? So, um, so what we're... Um, so what we're going to go and look at the details of um, how a mass spectrometer works. Now you would have seen that, um, so that's not topic one, obviously you, you wouldn't have seen that yet, but um, you need to know basically how this um, how this works. So we're going to take like a high level view of how they can be used to determine atomic mass. So what we do is we inject an element into the mass spectrometer and the isotopes that make up the element are ionized, okay? Um, so losing an electron and they produce this positive charge. So this is basically what we do to a sample when it gets put through a mass spectrometer. So as the element contains different isotopes, so remember what an isotope is, so this is right back into topic one, so that's what we're referring to here. We, we didn't actually look at the actual um, structure of the actual, um, uh, you know, how the machine works, but we did look at isotopes, so that's that's what we're referring to in topic one. Um, but remember, this is an atom with the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons, um, and they have different masses, and they can be separated out within the mass spectrometer. So effectively, you put the elements into the mass spectrometer, um, they're ionized first, okay, so basically you knock an electron, um, an electron, off them you then push them through the mass spectrometer which has a magnetic field and basically the um the heavier well you, you can break up the molecule if it's if it's a molecule but the heavier elements the heavier bits of the elements will basically um uh, will basically be deflected less by the magnetic field than ones which are lighter and this magnetic field is actually curved it's like a crescent shaped so for example your lighter elements will kind of bend much more easily and kind of shoot through the the spectrometer and come out the other side whereas your heavier ones will kind of come out a little bit they'll kind of take a little bit longer to actually curve around so it's a bit like um if you have a car i say if you had a bike and it was going around um a corner um, that bike is quite light, so it can get around the corner quite neatly. But something like a wagon, like a HGV, going at the same speed, will, you know, if you try to go around the corner quickly, it'll probably start to swing out. It'll take a little bit longer for it to get around that bend. So it's the same with these molecules here for a mass spectrometry. Um, so the different isotopes, in this case, we're looking at elements here. So the different isotopes are detected by a detector. They're displayed on a mass spectrum. And this is what we're going to look at here is basically what do these spectra show us. So let's have a look. So this is, we're going to look at an element here. So we've pushed an element through the mass spectrometer and out comes this um, spectra here. So we're going to look at different isotopes of an element. So what you'll notice <coughs> excuse me so what you'll notice is you've got at the bottom here um you've got your mz now this is your mass to charge ratio okay so this is effectively the mass of an element okay essentially because most of the ions that will go through will be plus one charge so this is just the same as the isotopic mass um, along the top here is the abundance, so this is basically the amount of that isotope that has been detected by the machine. Now in this case, sorry, in this case, it's actually done as a percentage. So we've got 75% of an isotope weighing 35, and we've got 25% of an isotope weighing 37, okay, with a mass of 37. So like I say, the abundance is on the axis. It can be shown as a percentage. Um, it can be a nominal value. It just depends on what it is. So just make sure you kind of pay attention to that. Um, if it's a percentage, they must add up to 100%, of course. So there we are. So they definitely add up to 100% there. Okay, so this spectra um, shows two isotopes of one element in this case. Okay, so we've got 75% of the isotopes are coming out as 
with a mass of 35 and 25 percent so a quarter of them are coming out as a mass of 37 okay and so from this we can actually work out the relative atomic mass of the substance which we're going to look at in the next slide okay so the relative atomic mass now you need to remember this formula okay is the abundance of a okay in other words how much of a we have um multiplied by the mass to charge ratio of a so that's the value basically at the bottom here where's my cursor there it is at the bottom there so that's your mz plus the abundance of b um, multiplied by the mass to charge ratio of b divided by the total abundance of what's there so let's use this example here to work this relative atomic mass out so the relative atomic mass is 75 multiplied by 35 because that's the mz for this one and then 25 multiplied by 37 basically multiplying these two together um, divide that by 100 because the total abundance is 100 if we add these up and that gets us 35.5. Now that's the relative atomic mass of this element that's been put through the um, machine. So if you look on the periodic table, you can find out that this element is actually chlorine that we've put through. So this spectrum has allowed us to identify the element that we've got here. Okay, so we can also um, obviously use this to work out... Um, if we've got a, a set of data here, as you can see, so instead of using a chart, we've actually got a, um, a table here. Um, similar because we have our isotope charge here. So we've got 70, 72, 73, 74, 75. So this element's got a lot of isotopes. And we've got the abundance of each one of them in total. Okay. So what we can do is use these figures here to work out what is the relative atomic mass of this element. And then we can use the periodic table to identify it. So let's put all the numbers in. Now, this is a bit bigger, obviously. So we'll put all the numbers in there, divide it by 100. And the answer is germanium. So germanium GE, and the answer is 72.6. So that is the relative atomic mass. So when we look at the periodic table, the numbers that you see is actually an average of the isotopes that make up that element. And all the mass spectrum is doing, mass spectrometer, is basically separating the isotopes out that make up that element and telling you how much you've got as a percentage of each of the isotopes and then we can put them into this formula to help us work out what that is okay so we're going to kind of move it on a little bit and take it up um, a notch so we're going to be looking at the mass spectrometer um, or using mass spectrometry to work out um, molecules so the relative molecular mass so there were atomic masses but we can also do it for molecules so here we've got a mass spectrum of um, a substance we don't know what it is yet but we know um, what its spectrum is and we can see you've got relative abundance on the top now this is just an arbitrary figure okay and we've got the different masses the molecular mass of this molecule going through so again we've got the mass to charge ratio at the bottom so that's no difference and then we've got the peaks here now the difference with a molecule is we don't have an atom we've got a molecule and what happens um when we um push a molecule through a mass spectrometer is it's actually fragmented it's broken up into little bits um, and what we're getting is the kind of fragments of that molecule. So they're kind of little bits there. It's a bit like breaking glass. You get loads of bits of glass kind of flying everywhere. But if you put them bits of glass together, you'll get your whole sheet again. So this is the same with this. You've got loads of these molecules going through. It's breaking it at different parts of the molecule. And we're getting the fragments of that molecule coming through here. Some of the fragments are really heavy. Some of them are not. Now, you'll always get a last peak you know, it's near the end anyway it's the last significant peak in the spectrum and this is the m plus peak okay and we call that the molecular iron peak now this is the when you put a molecule through a mass spectrometer and it breaks it up into different parts not all of the molecules are broken up it would have lost an electron so it's got a positive charge because that's the mass spectrometer needs that to detect the molecules in the first place but it hasn't actually been fragmented and so therefore this end peak the most significant end peak these ones are quite small so this is the most significant end peak um is the basically the the same of the is the same as the relative molecular mass of the molecule that we're looking at so it's a really important peak and obviously these are the fragments that help to make up that peak there 
So obviously you'll see a very small peak um, or some smaller peaks after the M peak or also known as M plus peak. And this is called an M plus one peak. Um, now some organic compounds which is likely to be put through these machines are made up of obviously carbon and hydrogen. Now some of them carbons and their molecules are will be carbon 12, the majority will be anyway, so they'll probably represent this M plus peak. But some of the elements in the molecule that we've put through here, some of the carbon atoms anyway, may be carbon 13. And carbon 13 atoms, or some of them might be carbon 13, are a little bit heavier. And so therefore we'll get some molecules here, full molecules, that may have a carbon 13 isotope in amongst that chain. Um, and that's why we get this kind of slightly higher peak here, and we call it an M plus 1 peak. And you might even get some, called an M plus 2 peak, um, some isotopes. So, for example, if you've got a molecule that contains chlorine, for example, it might be a... Um, it might be a, a chloroalkane, for example, um, then we know that chlorine actually is made up of two different isotopes. So you might have a molecule, the entire molecule, with a chlorine-35 isotope in there, and you might have an entire molecule with a chlorine-37 in there. So what you're getting is a peak. This peak might be a haloalkane with chlorine-35 in. This might be a haloalkane with chlorine-37. So what we get is um, a peak that is too heavier than the original peak and obviously this is showing isotopes of chlorine so we call this an m plus 2 peak so just be aware of these different peaks and what they actually mean okay so we talked about fragmentation just before and kind of getting different molecules so let's have a look at fragmentation in a little bit more detail because it can get a little bit kind of confusing so like we say, when you put a molecule through a mass spectrometer, they're bombarded with high energy electrons. And we call this fragmentation. It basically breaks that molecule up into kind of certain chunks. And actually, this fragmentation can be used to help determine the molecular structure of the, um, of the molecule that we're looking at. So let's have a look at an example here. So we've got propane fragments. Okay, so propane is CH3, CH2, CH3. Now, fragmentation produces a positive fragment and it produces a radical, okay? So, only the positive charged fragment is detected. Remember, for a mass spectrometer, the only bits which are detected by the detector at the end are positive charges. Any radicals will just simply not be detected whatsoever. They're produced, but they're never detected. So... The molecular iron peak, remember that's the peak right at the end of the spectrum, is produced and the molecular iron peak for propane would be CH3, CH2, CH3 plus. Okay, so it always has that positive charge. Now this spectrum will produce three major peaks and let's have a look and see what they are. So you've got this fragment is obviously your molecular iron that will be produced. Um, there is a way which that can be fragmented there and obviously it's going to be your CC atoms mainly which we are uh, CC bonds which should be broken because they're weakest so that will produce a CH3 CH2 dot and a CH3 plus now it's this bit that's only detected by the machine and likewise it can be fragmented the other way and you can form this as a positive charge so these are your three major peaks that are detected so if we put propane through the mass spectrometer we'll see that fragment that fragment and your molecular iron peak there and this is exactly what you see so this is your actual um, uh, mass spectrum that's produced there's your different fragments so you've got a fragment at ch3 plus is 15 You've got CH3, CH2 plus at 29 and at 44. So this is what you'll see. And obviously these fragments will make up that fragment there. Okay, that's your molecular iron peak. Okay, you might have a little one here as well because one of these carbons might be an isotope of carbon-13, in which case it will have a tiny, tiny little peak there. You won't get many of them because obviously you don't, it's not likely to get carbon-13. But if you do, you'll get a little peak here as well. And that's called your M plus 1 peak. Okay. So, um, smaller um, the smaller peaks, we've omitted some of the smaller peaks because um, there might be some in there as well from other fragments, but these are the major fragments there. So, you might want to look out for other ones. So, um, telltale signs, I suppose. If you see a peak at 17, it's likely to be an OH+. 
So this might be tell you you've probably got an alcohol maybe. Um, a peak at 15 tells you this is a class that you're going to find a lot of these as CH3 fragments. Um, peaks at 28 will tell you you've got a carbonyl fragment. So these little fragments here can help you determine what potentially what molecule you have. So just look out for some of these common masses here and that might help you to um, narrow down what you've got. Okay. So these fragmentation patterns, they can be used to identify molecules with the same constituent atoms. And this is because obviously the fragment masses will be different. So it's really good for things like isotopes. So here we've got propanal and uh, isotopes, sorry, isomers. So here we've got propanal and we've got propanone, as you can see on here. So they've basically got the same um, molecular formula. There's no difference there, but clearly they're two very different um, compounds aren't they they're very different now a mass spectrometer can kind of break these molecules up and you can detect what you've got so here's some major propanal fragments which is this one here. here's your aldehyde so you've got your propanal fragment itself which is 58 that's your molecular iron peak you could have ch3 ch2 so it could break there to form that chunk there and you've got coh which is this fragment here now if we do the same for propanone propanone obviously can break into different parts so here you're probably going to get a break here at ch3 so you're going to get ch3 plus you're probably going to get ch3 co plus which is the remaining fragment which is that bit there and you're going to get your molecular iron peak of 58 which is obviously the same as what it is up here but you can see we're getting different fragments from what we're getting between propanol and propanone and obviously the difference between the fragments that are produced can help distinguish between propanol and propanone so it can be a really useful bit of kit as you can see and obviously we can even identify unknown compounds by actually comparing a spectrum that we produce from mass spectrometry to a library of known spectra as well now obviously you won't have the kind of novelty of that in an exam so they are going to get you to kind of work these spectrum out yourself but it's just for kind of extra information okay so we can use this kind of carrying on with the fragmentation theme we can use this to look at the difference between peaks in a mass spectrum um, and this can tell us about fragments that may not actually show up on the chart now this is a bit weird okay so this really is literally kind of reading between the lines here so this is really similar to the technique that we've seen before i.e we need to know about the masses of some of the um of some of the common fragments so you can see in this chart you can see that we have um the results of a simplified spectrum of propane so some of the kind of minor peaks have been kind of removed they don't really play a role here so we're only really looking at the bigger peaks so there's a difference here between two of these masses here and the difference between two of the peaks is 29 okay so what fragments do we think might have been lost here so what we've got to be doing is got to be thinking about which fragments might have a mass of 29 that could be in propane so the mass of 29 this actually coincides with the loss of the ch3 ch2 dot and this is the equation here so effectively you've got ch3 ch2 ch3 plus which is the molecular iron peak here um, and that ch3 ch2 has obviously been lost and you form the ch3 plus so this difference here is the loss of that basically that has been removed from that molecule so we're just looking at what that difference could be between the two now this is going to be quite useful when you look at we'll look at some other examples as well later on but this kind of loss of substance is quite important so just have a real think about these ones here because they can be quite tricky i know there could be a lot of different things here but they are going to give you quite simplified versions of these molecules and they're probably more likely to be hydrocarbons if there could be a lot of possibilities of what this loss could be the exam model will narrow it down for you and say right this is what it could be and hence go from there so kind of look for the clues i suppose okay so 
there are times when fragments don't form stable positive charges though and so this doesn't form a peak on the mass spectrum which doesn't really help so like i say we can work out the difference from what i've showed you before in peak value and this can be vital evidence for some of these missing peaks so we've got this graph here um to the right so this is a, a mass spectrum here we've got relative intensity um, which is just relative values and we've got our mz on the bottom there so here we have the mass spectrum. In this case, it's for chlorobenzene. Now, don't be too concerned about the benzene bit. Okay, this is, you'll see this in A level, um, the full A level, but it's chlorobenzene. And what we have really here is two peaks. So we've got a peak at MZ 112, okay? And we've got a peak at MZ 114. Now, we know that chlorine, because this is the most important bit, has two isotopes of 35 and 37, okay so we know that and their relative abundance is 75 to 25 so the peak at 112 okay which is this one here okay that one there um is three times bigger than the peak at 114 which is this one here so the m plus peak is 112 so this means the 114 is the m plus two peak okay this kind of unique split of a um uh, 75 percent to 25 percent ratio with a difference of two is a really strong suggestion that you've got a chlorine in here there isn't many isotopes that have that split with that um that difference of two so whenever you see something like that you've got to think yeah it could be a chlorine in there okay so just be really vigilant for that specific pattern so from this we would expect to see significant peaks at 35 and 37 to show the chlorine isotope fragments which have broken away from benzene however as you can see here they're not there they're missing okay so the peak at mz77 though and this is what we call a phenyl iron again you'll probably see this a little bit more um is present in this in this molecule here so basically if we look at the difference between the m plus peak which is the molecular iron and 77 then we get a loss of 35 and if you look in the periodic table and you look at the the relative atomic mass of an element with 35 that shows you that actually it is chlorine that's there so sometimes and i know this might sound really odd but sometimes that chlorine for example won't appear in the spectrum so looking for mass losses or differences is just as powerful and actually just as vital as actually looking for the peaks themselves so just make sure you're aware of these differences in the actual um you know in the peaks okay so kind of sticking with the mass spectrometry um you see there's a lot of information on mass spec here um so we can also calculate the number of carbon atoms in a compound using a mass spectrum and we use this very simple formula so we can use and this is a specific one that you've got to you've got to remember basically you must remember this so we can work out the number of carbon atoms in a compound by using this formula so n is obviously the number of um atoms 100 times by the abundance of the m plus one iron okay divided by 1.1 times by the abundance of the m plus ion so this is your molecular iron here so we've got our spectrum here there's your m plus and there's your m plus one which is the middle one just squeezed in there so here we can see the relative abundance of the m plus one peak now in your graph it's going to be easier to read but this is approximately seven okay now in your example you will get a graph that you'll be able to read it it's not quite as easy to read it on the screen here but it's approximately seven and the relative abundance of the m plus iron this one here is 100 so that goes right up to the 100 there so the calculation should be 100 times 7 okay divided by 1.1 times 100 and if you round this to the nearest whole number this gives us an n of 6 so this is telling us that this compound should have six carbon atoms in the um in the spectrum okay in the in the actual molecule so it's a nice neat little way of kind of accelerating how many carbons you've got rather than trying to work out what it is it's a good place to start with this to be honest okay so let's finally look at 
high resolution mass spectrometry um so as it suggests it sounds very technological advanced uh, kind of advanced bit of kit here it's like hd tv and um, this is high resolution mass spectrometry and it's really useful for identifying molecules with the same molecular mass um, and they're rounded to the hit nearest whole number okay so it's kind of like high resolution, of course. So your high resolution mass spectrometers, these measure the relative mass of what you're putting through the machine to several decimal places. Unlike your kind of standard low resolution, which will only really be able to detect relative masses to the nearest whole number, which is fine for the majority of molecules. But if you're running um, chemicals through with the same molecular mass, it's not that much good because you're not really going to identify the difference. So, for example, let's bring back ethanol and propane. Um, these have a the MR of 44 to the nearest whole number. So, if you put that through a standard mass spectrometer, it wouldn't know the difference. Okay, so it wouldn't be able to uh, tell the difference between the, the the masses of them. So, we can use the atomic mass data to measure to four decimal place. And we can distinguish between the two. So we know that carbon 12 is exactly 12. Hydrogen is 1.0078. And oxygen is 15.9990. So this is to the nearest four decimal places. So if we look at the molecular mass of your um, ethanol, which is here. So we put the numbers in. Literally use the exact numbers here. And that gives us 44.0302. And if we look at the molecular mass of propane then that gives us 44.0624, as you can see there. So it's obviously slightly different. Okay, So mass spectrometer can obviously detect these two. Um, and a standard, um, a standard low resolution spectrum for both of these would actually just show 44. So using high resolution or using specific numbers can obviously help us to distinguish between the two. And obviously we can, we can see that there. Okay, and that's it. That is the end of everything for year one chemistry. And it ends off with a bang with analytical techniques. So like I say, the full range of year one and year two slides are available on the Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. Please hit the subscribe button to show your support for the project. It would be massively appreciated. Um, and as I said, these are available to purchase as well. Click on the link in the description box um, and you can purchase these slides along with the full of year one and year two specification if you wish um right that's it then right see you later bye bye